Hi everyone, this is Jim. Uh, welcome to this postmortem for my uh, Blitz Chess game number four. Uh, I lost this one, so at least uh, you can't accuse me of just showing you my wins. Um, this was a pretty interesting game. I started off with d4 and we got into a uh, Queen's Gambit declined and um, my opponent just uh, outplayed me pretty soundly. Um, and let's let's take a look and see how it happened. So I start off with d4 and he went with knight c he went with knight f6 which is a very flexible response and um, could be followed up with either g6 or e6 yeah how's it go yeah e6 or g6 this g6 is the king's indian and e6 uh, leading to the nimzo indian normally so i play c4 he plays e6 and i'm expecting a nimzo indian at this point um, but he fools me by playing d5. And you can see that's still uh, a popular move in this position, so the number two. So we've been playing very mainline stuff so far. Um, I play e3, which is a little bit unusual in this position. Maybe knight f3 is the uh, more standard move. But uh, e3 is a system that works against both the Nimzo Indian and the Queen's Gambit declined, and it, it's quite playable. Um, and if you see, the number of games is picked up. So if he were to play c6, for example, we transpose into a very standard position in the semi-slav. <coughs> or if he plays bishop b4, which he did in a slightly less usual move, and I follow up with knight f3, uh, you can see we've gotten pretty much back into normal channels. So this move here, a6, is the one that's, that's uh, unusual. And um, I didn't uh, find the best way to refute this. But let's uh, switch out of the opening book. You can see we're pretty much out of the opening book at this point since he played a3. Oh, if we back up. A move before a3. The most normal response here would just be castles. Uh, he could also try c5 right away. It's an interesting idea too. Let's switch back to the the other view. I keep hitting the wrong button. <clears throat> this one, the notation view. So knight f3, a6. Yeah, so let's turn on the engine here. See what uh, Houdini thinks of these positions. So it thinks um, the opening is going along okay. I, I play a3 to kick the bishop, and he decides to take. He could have uh, also retreated if he wanted to. <clears throat> and uh, then he takes on c4, and I take back with the bishop. And um, the computer actually likes my position here. I think uh, the next few moves, though, I start to get into trouble. Um, he starts off with b5, and I go to uh, d3. So. The bishop on this diagonal is, is poised for a kingside attack and also to support an advance through the center. <clears throat> but part of my problem is this uh, the center square is uh, something that black seizes on immediately. And this is actually one of the ideas of the Nimzo Indian. You get rid of this bishop here. <laughs> you use your bishop to get rid of this knight that's normally on c3, uh, which would be attacking these squares. And... Um, so you've gotten rid of that knight, so uh, now the bishop is hitting these squares, the black knight is hitting these squares, and so black is trying to set up a strong uh, grip on the center with pieces, whereas I'm trying to push my pawns into the center. And it's interesting, at this point, the computer says it's time to forget about the center, leave this setup alone for a moment, and go after these weak pawns that black created over here, because he had to, uh, he played these moves to kick my bishop around and uh, I can take advantage of that. It's a bit of a waste of time for black, and I can also undermine these pawns and, and see if they're, they become weak. Um, but I didn't do that. I had this idea of a central pawn push. So I, I started out by castling. He castles, and then I play this move, knight d2. So now my advantage is significantly declined. So basically, yeah, the computer thinks I'm just following the wrong path. It still thinks a4 is, is the right way to play this. But um, so this is a lesson to <clears throat> all of you chess players out there not to be too obsessed about following a single plan, but uh, look at the position, see where the weaknesses are, and, and plan your game accordingly. Um, so I follow ahead with e4 as I was planning, and now it's actually swung to even or better for black. So just the computer does not approve of this plan. And one idea here, which I totally missed, is that there's a pin. If you look at the queen, the queen is attacking the bishop indirectly. The bishop is undefended. 
and uh, because the knight's blocking the, my queen from defending the bishop. So this is undefended, which means uh, black's knight can actually jump to this square here or that square there, taking advantage of the pin if I take the knight. Now, I guess only this square. Take that back. Yeah, so if the knight comes to this square here, I can take the knight and the queen can take my bishop and my pawns are messed up and uh, the material is even. So <clears throat> black is standing good there. It doesn't work so well on the other side because the knight came here and I took it. Um, then the queen could take my bishop, but I could take a second knight, so I'd come out ahead. <clears throat> okay, but my opponent didn't spot this idea of knight c5 and instead played rook c8, a good, good solid move. And um, I'm continuing with my idea of uh, trying to support the center. And black naturally tries to undermine the center. And I maybe gave up a little too easily here. Again, a4 is a good idea to try and undermine these pawns over here. I was a little worried about this pawn push to c5, um, but that appears to not be a concern. I guess the bishop just drops back to c c2. The pawn push to c4 causing this bishop to drop back to c2. So I pushed ahead, and he played knight d5. Yeah, it was a mental mistake here. If you look at this position, before I pushed the pawn, I was talking to myself saying, well, the, the knight can't come to these squares because the queen guards it, and it can't come to these squares because the, the bishop, uh, this square is protected by the bishop of the knight, and this square is protected by the pawn, so the knight would be pushed back to some backward square. But of course, once I've moved my pawn forward, it opens up a nice square for the knight. So common <coughs> mistake, but uh, I should know better than that. <laughs> Definitely. I think I was a little uh, out of it this game, in at least in that part. Not, not noticing a consequence like that is pretty basic. Okay, so following up with queen g4 would be a good idea here. Throughout the rest of the game, I kept trying to figure out how I could get a kingside attack going, which is what you want. When you set up this pawn chain like this and chase black's pieces away from the king, your next thought is, well, look, the king is over here. Not, not too much going on uh, in terms of his peace support. Maybe I can get my queen out there and attack. Um, I tried pinning the knight first, and he counters immediately with f5, which if you'll see, the computer thinks that's really a great reply. Uh, thinks other replies are good as well, but um, f5 is a good move. Shuts down my attacking ideas, makes it difficult for my queen to um, come over here, and um, after I take on Passanda's knight, gets a good square. So, but... Uh, Allowing this pawn to stay here and push my pieces around, I think that's also bad for me. So I go ahead and take on Passant. He takes back with the knight, and I uh, retreat the bishop. Ah, now this is an interesting point, because you see there's a big jump in the evaluation there. So it says I should retreat to f3. After I go to c2, there's this tactic immediately with knight f4 attacking the pawn. And let's follow this a little bit. This is kind of interesting. So if the knight went to f4... <clears throat> and he's double attacking this pawn here, so I have to defend it some way, and it's not easy to defend. I think that's the point. It forces a pawn weakness. Then he can take over here, and I take back, and now he's got pressure on the C file, and he can just take here on G2. This is pretty interesting. <clears throat> so if I take back... Why is this working? What happens if king takes? Just knight g4. Taking advantage of this pin, a knight jumps to a good square and threatens a fork <laughs> of the king, the rook, and the queen. Okay, that's, that's a terrific tactic. Here, let's back up and take a look at that again. Bang, 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 bang. Okay, the c takes d4 is a little bit of a sideshow. The main idea is knight f4, f3, and then sacrifice the knight on g2, and then play the knight to g4, threatening this tremendous fork. So if we back up, see if you can visualize it in this position. Knight f4 you can think of as a good idea, generally, because it's uh, attacking a piece and moving... moving uh, attacking a pawn over here and moving one of the pieces forward. Suppose um, if I try g3, that just weakens my position here, and he can place a, a bishop on that square, for example, and threaten to... 
No, the knight also. Actually, g3 ma loses immediately. This is a nice trick, too. g3, new variation, knight h3, mate. <laughs> this is something you should all know. So the bishop is covering these squares, and the knight is attacking the queen, the king. Boom. So that's checkmate, and all the other squares are covered by my own pieces. So definitely g3 is out. So f3, you play to stop that. Let's back up. Let's see if we can visualize this. Threatening knight takes. F3 is played. G3 can't be played. And uh, after F3, knight takes anyway. King takes. And then the king is in this pin from the bishop. And this knight can come in to G4, taking advantage of that pin and threatening. A uh, pretty nasty fork here. So those are the kind of tactics. It's very useful if you can spot them during a game. So try and, try and sharpen your eye for things like that. Uh, my opponent missed that, but he still has a, a pretty good position. He plays CD first, so this is maintaining his advantage. I play... Oh, he plays Rook F7. <coughs> and um, says I should follow up with Rook E1. I had this idea of getting my knight to uh, E5. That's a good square for my knight. I, I, again, I was overlooking this knight F4 uh, idea, idea of attacking the, the G2. On. I was just uh, missing missing my opponent's tactics here. And so he plays knight f4 immediately, and um, I play knight e5 without even bothering to, to deal with this threat. So I guess, uh, again, this is one of those things where I wasn't looking one move ahead. Uh, the knight here is currently blocking the bishop's view of this square on g2. So, But when I move the knight out of the way, then, then obviously I'm just giving up a pawn here. And he grabs it. Ah, that's that's another part of this. <clears throat> I thought since the knight was moving here, I was attacking the rook, he would have to move the rook first, and I would have time to deal with this. But he can move the rook with a threat. The rooks have doubled up and attacked my bishop, and that forces me to deal with the bishop, which is worth more than a pawn. So it means I'm losing this pawn over here anyway. So I play bishop b3. He takes, and um, now I play an okay move. It's bishop takes e6 check. It's uh, if you give the computer a little more time to think about it, it, it finds it. Um, rookie one is probably still better. But um, knight takes e6 is the recommended move. And after the king to f8, actually, <clears throat> I, I'm sort of back in the game. You see um, black's advantage has decreased a little bit. And the way to uh, deal with this is just to take the rook. And for some reason, I decided to save my rook. I guess I didn't see a big difference, but uh, you'll see in the game there is a quite, a, quite a difference. When I play my rook here, he can follow up with knight takes e6. Um, let's show that. He can follow up with knight takes e6. It's a variation. Um, I have to grab the bishop here to maintain equality. In fact, that was my plan. But then he gets this queen check in here, which is pretty strong. My queen drops back, and the knight comes back to f4. He's starting mate, and um, it's going to be hard to defend this. And my kingside is kind of shattered. So this this was going to be a tough position to play, and that was probably best for him. When when black instead played bishop d5, this again gives me a chance to at least grab the rook on c8 and uh, relieve some of this pressure on the c file. Um, I missed that idea. I took his bishop. He comes back, and now he's just winning. There's basically nothing I can do. I can stop the immediate mate threat with f3, but then his rook comes down the c-file, and it's all over here. Um, there's a very pretty mate at the end. He checks me, and my king is um, forced to go right or left. If you see the evaluation here, there's only two legal moves, and uh, if I go king h1, I'm losing the queen, and I'm still probably losing. The game. <laughs> I'm going to lose the game shortly, is what I mean to say. So I tried the uh, other idea, which is the other square, the only other legal square, which is king f1, and that leads to another very nice mate. Uh, when the knight and the rook together combine to mate, the knight covers the rook, the rook attacks the king and guards this escape. This can happen in the corner, um, but it can also happen anywhere along the back rank when this escape square over here is guarded by one of, uh, is blocked by one of white's own pieces. Um, so and all the other squares are covered by black's pieces. So that's checkmate. And that was the end of the game. So well played, Danny. I think uh, he uh, maybe didn't play the most accurately when he got an advantage, but he, he played uh, good moves. 
throughout and took advantage of my imprecise opening play and uh, and uh, found some nice tactics here. So hope you guys enjoyed that and uh, leave any comments you have in the section below. See you later. Bye.